We're sitting up here on Mount Huth out here in eastern Yuba County, up in northern California in Jefferson, the state of Jefferson. And um, if you're connected to us, happy to have you. If you're not, just sleep away out there in Oliver and Linda. So uh, we are 1410 AM, the Patriot. That's AM. And we have an FM 104.3 if you prefer FM. If you got a bad attitude about AM, you can just go over there to FM. Or you can listen on the computer. If you're out there in a fringe area that is a little scratchy or it's fading in and out, you can go to KMYCradio.com and go to the Listen Live button, and hopefully our live stream is working. And if you can only listen for a little bit, and you wish you could listen to the whole thing, but you don't have time because you've got some honeydews to pull off today or you've got somewhere to be, you can go to uh, a YouTube channel. So on your computer, if you go to YouTube and then put in one eye, <clears throat> blind media, four separate words with space in between, one eye, blind media, that's a channel that uh, the... The organizer of that channel, Chris Starkey, has placed our old programs, and this current program will be on there in a couple days. And you can just look up the Live with Lou under his lists, Live with Lou, and pick out whatever program you want to listen to. So One Eye Blind Media, and you're good to go. You can listen to that whenever you want, 24 hours a day, and listen to it loud and clear. I think he even scrubs out a lot of the commercials and changes a lot of the music because of copyright issues on YouTube. So there you have it. You can listen to it however you want. So we're here till noon today. And, uh, if you want to call in, although sometimes your calls aren't convenient. And so we may have to abort your call at seven, four, two, 55, 55. This is a pro choice radio show. So I may not like your call or it may not be convenient or it may not go the way I planned. It wasn't a planned call, so we may have to abort the call. Seven four two fifty five fifty five. We have a few sponsors that that uh, like what we do. If you like what we do, you could be a sponsor as well. Uh, one of them is the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots, and uh, so we thank them for their support. They've been around here, I don't know, about seven years or so. And I'll give you some more details about their meetings in a bit. So the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots and uh, a couple other friends of mine, Ted Holmes with the Plumbing Doctor. So they keep keep all the right things flowing in the right direction. And also Dave Green at Construction, who the only problem with Dave is when he remodels your kitchen and bath, you never want to leave the house. So. But uh, Dave Greenitz Construction or Greenitz Construction, Green ETZ, Greenitz Construction. So, uh, again, we're here for three hours, and we're happy you're uh, paying attention today. Uh, <clears throat> we've been following um, this DACA thing and, uh, the, you know, the Dreamers. <clears throat> you remember when Obama – was making one executive order after another. Did you ever wonder whether those orders were legal or not? Well, the president of the United States really has no power to create immigration policy. 
uh, he can uh, enforce the law that's been made by Congress, but Congress did not make any law to allow people to come in the borders. In fact, it's just the opposite. You have to go through a process to come in the borders. So Obama basically created confusion and chaos and invited people uh, through his words, through his speeches, and through unofficial communications to y'all come. And so you remember those trains with people sitting on top of them from Central America and South America and Mexico coming in, supposedly all these children. And uh, did you notice that that hasn't been happening lately? You wonder why it was happening under Obama. It's not happening right this minute. So Obama basically did something that was entirely illegal. So it's interesting. So many people in this country right now have no idea what the law says. And they don't really want to be a, pe- a, a nation of laws. They just want to be a nation of if it d- does good, if it feels good, does it do it? If it feels good, do it. So, if something, if a policy uh, is given and they like it, then whether it's l- lawful or not, they uh, they get it on. And if it's taken away and they don't like it, then they riot, and it has nothing to do with law anymore. So it's interesting that uh, according to DACA, we can't deport illegal aliens because it's not fair to hold them accountable for something their parents did. In other words, their parents came into the country and were legal or, the, or were illegal, right? Parents sneak across the border and they bring their toddlers who don't know what border. They don't know what country they're in, what border they're crossing. But the parents do something illegal. Like when I go to Vietnam here in a few weeks, I could try to sneak into Vietnam or I could go in with a visa. If I go, if I sneak in and they ask for my papers, they'll arrest me if I don't have correct papers. So DACA is uh, saying we can't deport illegal aliens because it's not fair to hold them accountable for something their parents did. They're, these kids weren't born here. They were brought here illegally. But it's interesting, the liberals then will say, will take this point of view. And then they'll turn around and say that I'm at fault as a white guy. I'm blamed and held responsible for slavery, even though none of my people even lived here during the time of slavery. We immigrated after slavery. No one in my family had a slave. And probably most of you have no lineage that goes back to if you're a white person or even if you're a black pe- person. Some, some of you black folks, your ancestors had slaves. But I, I can be blamed as a white person and held responsible for slavery and slavery laws that are called Jim Crow laws because of the actions of people totally un- unrelated to me. I'm held responsible for that, but yet a kid that's brought here illegally is considered a victim and isn't a part of the crime. Interesting, isn't it? Well, the problem we have now with the Dreamer situation, Donald Trump did exactly the right thing, different from Obama, who was an uh, unlawful president. Trump is actually following the law and basically saying to Congress, you have a problem. You need to straighten out the legalities of what's going on here with these quote unquote dreamers. And uh, he's given them six months to take care of it. Your opinion as a, as a uh, citizen really doesn't have any impact unless you want to talk to your congressman and say, I think we should do this or that, and the congressman needs to vote on it, and they need to resolve the problem. That's their job. If you read the Constitution, Congress makes the laws, not the president, and the president president can make sure that the laws are enforced. That would be his responsibility. He's executive branch. He does not have the right to create laws or make policies. He can't even do a treaty on his own without the confirmation of the Senate. So that's that.
<clears throat> I want to talk about this uh, pot fiasco. Uh, <clears throat> Buck Weckman, who has been leading the charge uh, <clears throat> with a couple of groups, one's called FACT, <clears throat> Families Against Trafficking Cannabis, or cannabis trafficking, and then another one called Stop. But he sent out an email and kind of summarizing where we are here in Yuba County. Now, I know that about people from five different counties listen to this show, but I think all of you are kind of in the same boat unless you're down in an urban area. Up here in Northern California, it's a great place to grow marijuana. And because it's so rural, uh, there's a lot of space to grow it when you're not in a subdivision. And so there's sort of been a perfect storm happen. There's been uh, more and more legislation or propositions voted on to open up the doors of marijuana use by folks that have medical conditions and then to uh, grow a certain amount of marijuana. And so different counties throughout the state of California have kind of come up with different rules on allowing people that have medical conditions to grow their own, right? And so there's the the laws are changing. The challenge has been for law enforcement to figure out which laws to enforce because federal and state and county laws don't always match exactly. In fact, county to county can change to, on how to grow marijuana. Combined with the fact that we have some of the great greatest growing weather and soils in the nation in California. And so what's happened is sort of a perfect storm of people wanting to take advantage uh, of this situation to make a lot of money. The fact is a lot of money can be made fairly quickly in one harvest, in fact, of marijuana. And so we have people coming into Yuba County, I'm speaking specifically about Yuba County here this morning, coming into Yuba County from all over the United States and maybe outside the United States in some situations like with cartel people. And so uh, Buck Weckman a few weeks ago asked the Board of Supervisors to declare a state of emergency. And I think the Board of Supervisors in Yuba County just kind of think, hey, Buck's over the top. He's, he's really... Uh, He's really kind of tilt, tilted the, the scale here. and uh, But Buck gives a little review in his email, and he says on August 18th, about 50 Yuba County residents appeared before the Board of Supervisors asking um, for more actions against the invasion of the marijuana industry. And at that time, uh, Buck pre presented a draft resolution of state of emergency uh, and presented it to the board on the 22nd, the board of supervisors adopted four, um, uh, state of emergencies. Uh, or, uh, let me back up and restate that in the past, the board of supervisors had adopted a number of state of emergencies. You remember the Oroville, dam spillway failure. Uh, they declared a state of emergency there. We also had heavy winter rains. Do you remember those? And it did a lot of damage uh, on roadways, ditches, and we had a state of emergency there. There were flooding. Uh, we also have had floods in previous winters. And we've had a state of emergency declared. I believe Randy Fletcher, the Board of Supervisors, uh, instigated or was the catalyst to have a state of emergency declared over the number of dead trees in our forest because of poor forest man management. So Buck, Buck is basically making the argument is, hey, uh, state of emergencies, declaring them uh, is, is uh, a common thing when there's a big problem. And uh, so... It's interesting that this week, the county of Siskiyou 
has made a, a resolution about a state of emergency up there at the request of their sheriff, Sheriff Lopi. Now, this is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, let me get back over to my notes on this. Because, uh, you know, in these northern counties, we have about 70,000 people or so in Yuba County, but the farther north you go, some of these counties just have 20,000 people in them. 15, 30, 000, 15 to 30,000 people up in the north. And so there's lots of open area to hide out and grow marijuana. So they've been having a problem up in Siskiyou County. Now, Siskiyou County is interesting because, because Mark Baird, uh, who started uh, the movement with the state of Jefferson, uh, he's up there in Siskiyou County. It's beautiful county. But they've been having an issue up there because uh, there's a lot of growing going on. And it's interesting. I didn't realize this, but there's a lot of Hmong people up there that are growing marijuana. And recently, a couple of the Hmong folks met privately with Sheriff Lopi and offered him a million dollars if he would not... Uh, raid any of their, I think about eight different grow sites. In other words, they've been raiding grow sites in Siskiyou County. And so they sat down with the sheriff and they said, listen, let's make a deal and we'll, uh, we'll help you out if you can help, uh, help us out. Well, unfortunately for the Hmong couple, Sheriff Lopi called in the federal Bureau of investigation and put on a wire and recorded the conversation uh, and he accepted eighty thousand dollars while he talked to them to exempt eight eight these eight properties that was sort of a down payment and uh, and then they actually handed over ten thousand five hundred dollars well anyway they were arrested but Sheriff Lopi has now gone on to the Board of Supervisors because things are out of control, and they passed a resolution up there because a number of reasons. One is that there's uh, mass violations of the law. Number two, uh, the rampant use of illegal pesticides, improper storage of waste, the lack of permitted living quarters. In other words, buildings being put up, wells being drilled. Uh, no permits being issued. And uh, basically things are out of control. So they passed uh, this state of emergency declaration. <clears throat> and their hope is that that will open up uh, more resources. Usually when you declare a state of emergency, if the government can, if the governor and the government concurs with that, it will open up other resources that can come in and assist your county. In other words, each county has its own uh, infrastructure to take care of heavy rains, uh, natural disasters, et cetera, et cetera. But if there's a, like if there's a like we just had a <coughs> a gas tanker, a fuel tanker flip over and dump out, I don't know, thousands of gallons of fuel. <coughs> I think. They were able to handle that locally, but if they couldn't, then state uh, resources could be brought in. Same way with a forest fire flood or whatever. So this is a uh, an opportunity to bring in uh, outside resources. But <clears throat> what it does is show how uh, reasonable that Buck Weckman's request was. Uh, to declare a state of emergency. Now, <clears throat> Randy Fletcher, who is the fifth district supervisor up in uh, the foothills of Yuba County, has asked everyone to call him to report various grows and to give their perspective. So I'm going to give his number, 743-7979. I don't know whether that... Uh, that's a home phone or what it is. It doesn't really say it's seven, four, three, 79, 79. That's supervisor, Randy Fletcher, or, uh, you could call the sheriff's department, which is seven, four, nine, seven, 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 seven. That's actually a, uh, a, 
that's not nine one one. It's it's the office line. It'll go through a series of uh, prompts to get you through. So I would just I would focus on Fletcher. It'd be easier seven four three seventy nine seventy nine. That may be an answering machine. I don't know, but let them know your feelings. And also let him know about any grows that you notice. Uh, he's He actually asked for that. We're not kind of just trying to cause him problems. He asked for that. And so uh, we're just uh, trying to help him out and inform him. Uh, there actually have been many, many grows that have been reported. Uh, on 828, August 28, 28 illegal marijuana grows was turned into code enforcement and a complaint filed. Uh there, there have been actually a lot more grows turned in than that. So this is a time to all work together. If you think that if you you live in Yupa County, everything's just going to work out because uh, it's just fate and things all work out, uh, you're really wrong. You really need to change your way and get involved and take a stand. And uh, if you don't know what to do, maybe you should educate yourself. And so uh, we will be right back. We're going to take a break here, and we'll be right back for another two and a half hours. We'll be ending at noon. For the immigrants who were welcomed by this statue, America was truly a land of opportunity. For the first time in their lives, many were truly free to pursue their own objectives. That freedom released the human energies which created the United States. There were few government programs to turn to and nobody expected them. But also, there were few rules and regulations. There were no licenses, no permits, no red tape to restrict them. They found, in fact, a free market, and most of them thrived on it. We need to rediscover the old truths that the immigrants knew in their bones, what economic freedom is, and the role it plays in preserving personal freedom. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. If what people get is not going to be determined on what they produce, on how they produce it, on how successfully they work, what incentive is there for them to act in accordance with the information that's transmitted? There's only one alternative, force. Some people telling other people what to do. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions. The Republican establishment is trying to nullify the 2016 election. That's a brutal fact we have to face. The Republican establishment. The Republican establishment. Wants to nullify the 2016 election. Trying to nullify the 2016 election. Right. Absolutely. Who? I think, I think Mitch McConnell to a degree, Paul Ryan. They do not want Donald Trump's populist, economic, nationalist agenda to be implemented. It's very obvious. It's obvious as, it's obvious as, it's obvious as night follows day. Give me a story that illustrates that. Well, Mitch McConnell, when we first met him, I mean, he, was, he, was, he, he said, I think in one of the first meetings uh, in Trump Tower with the president, as, as we're wrapping up, he basically says, I don't want to hear any more of this drain the swamp talk flat out. He goes, a guy up on Capitol Hill can't buy a Coke unless it's got to be reported. He says, I can't, can't hire any smart people because everybody's all over them for reporting requirements and, and the pay, et cetera, and the scrutiny. You know, you got to back off that. The drain the swamp thing was, was Mitch McConnell was day one. Did not want to, did not want to go there, wanted us to back off. You are attacking on many fronts people who you need to help you to get things done. They're not going to help you unless they're put on notice. They're going to be held accountable if they do not support the President of the United States. Right now, there's no accountability. They have totally, they do not support the President's program. It's an open secret on Capitol Hill. Everybody in the city knows it. And so, therefore, now that you're out of the White House, you go into war with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Welcome back. 
sometimes people don't uh, do anything because they feel all alone. Uh, they don't think one person can do anything. Some people say, well, why vote? Just one vote doesn't really make a difference. I don't really agree with that, but I think people hold that view. Or they feel, why complain? It's just my voice. I'm nobody. I don't have any influence. I certainly understand that. So a number of years ago, uh, a movement just kind of sprung up because of people's being furious. And it was called the Tea Party Movement. And at the beginning of that movement, a lot of folks that had become very frustrated with the entire political system, all flavors of it, uh, they began to organize in grassroots groups called the Tea Party, and all these uh, organizations sprung up across the country, and they began to have meetings. But what I feel was the most effective part of it was they became activists and they began attending uh, the city council meetings, the supervisor meetings, town hall meetings, and some of them even wore paraphernalia shirts and hats that portrayed their view. They were Tea Party. And you remember the media really mocked them, just mocked them the term Tea Party. They call them tea bags and really made sexual, degrading, denigrating comments about them. But millions and millions of people uh, identified with the Tea Party as uh, a, uh, with the Tea Party activists in Boston when they th they dumped the tea from the ships from England into the harbor as a protest, right? And so the Tea Party really became so effective here in our time because uh, they didn't want to go along when he didn't go along to get along or get along to go along either way you want to look at it. They just didn't want to keep doing same o same o with promises that things are going to be different. And so they, they were influential, the tea party people, although tea party people will say, well, they didn't really endorse any candidates. They certainly got behind certain candidates and saw them get elected. Uh, some of the people that come to mind are people like Ted Cruz and Mike Lee that are now in the uh, Senate. And so locally in the Yuba Sutter area, the, the effectiveness of the P Tea Party was uh, when they attended meetings or they organized opposition or support of certain issues or certain people. And so uh, the Tea Party, we used to have a couple of meetings, one in Marysville, one in Yupp City. Now we have one meeting uh, that's the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots that meets over at Church of Glad Tidings at 1179 Eager Road. Or uh, if you want to coordinate, it's just Highway 99 in Eager. And they meet the first and third Monday night of the month. And so the next meeting is the 18th of, the, of this month. And... Um, they get together at six thirty over there, and they have a lot of. Uh, they've had a lot of good speakers. They have uh, candidate forums, which they'll probably have some coming up here before too long, with the, another election cycle coming up. But they have other speakers that are relevant to what's going on in our country today, and to, to help educate folks. One of the the real weaknesses that I find is in folks is they they have a good heart, but they don't know. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know what the law is. They don't know what the Constitution is. And you think, wow, I no longer am involved in school. It's easy to get a little copy of the Constitution and read it, but you can get uh, some education on the Constitution a couple of ways. I know Hillsdale, Hillsdale College out of Michigan uh, has an online course you can take. But the Tea Party also is offering uh, a course on Wednesdays starting September 20th, again, at the Church of Glad Tidings. And uh, those classes are going to be conducted in Building 500. It's a two-story building out there in room 210, 212. 
So you can, if you think, gee, I, I need to find out what's going on. Because if you're wondering, like, should we deport people or what are the rules like on immigration? Who gets to make those decisions? You don't know. Uh, maybe you should take a basic constitution class. You know, like I, I get a kick out of people say, well, these are my rights. I got rights. Really, you don't have any rights unless you understand what your rights are. You can just say, anybody can say anything they want. That doesn't mean anything. It's whether you really know which rights you really do have, according to the Constitution. We're a nation of laws, whether the left, left-wing people want to believe that or not. So you can call, uh, if you want to get involved in the Tea Party education system led by Tammy Reichard, uh, you can dial her up and register at 701-2845. That's a 530 area code, 701-2845 or trikard at gmail.com. That's T-R-I-K-A-R-D, T-R-I-K-A-R-D. And you can uh, get involved in that. I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, it's not going to be a course you would get at a, at a uh, law school. It'll be broken down, easy to understand. And if you don't have time to go out there on Wednesday night, you could certainly, I, I, I heard recently that, uh, Hillsdale College is, again, offering their free online course, and I would encourage you to do that, too. It's important to to get some information. Knowledge, you've heard it before, knowledge is power. So the Tea Party folks are meeting uh, first and third Mondays of every month at Church of Glad Tidings, 1179 Eager Road. Anybody can, you, you don't have to be a member. You can just drop in and just get it on. So, uh Go check it out. You can also, they have a, a, keep up with them on their website. They have a website that uh, the short version is SBTPP, Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots, SBTPP.org. And you can uh, see what they have going on. They'll post it there for you. And you could, you can keep up with them even if you miss a meeting or so. The other, the other person that I really uh, have high regard for, uh, regarding updates on current situations and and how the Constitution applies, whether it's taking over federal lands from farmers like the Bundys and the Hammonds up in Oregon and all that's going on with that to the immigration stuff uh, is Chris Ann Hall. And Chris Ann Hall has been a big speaker around Tea Party forums throughout the United States. She is a trained attorney. She is a former, uh, she's an Army veteran who was injured, uh, wounded. She also uh, was trained in the Russian language in her work with the military. But now she's, uh, she's served in, I, th I think, the state of Florida, and then was kind of she kind of fell out of favor because of her conservative leanings, uh, working for the uh, I don't know was U.S. attorney or state attorney down there. But you can check her out at chrisannhall.com. That's K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E Hall, all one word, chrisannhall.com. She has a lot of good. Uh, she has books you can read that she's written. She has videos. You can uh, tap into her on Facebook, and she'll give you an education in just a few minutes on a hot topic and how it relates to the, uh, the law. And her feeling is that the Congress, it, this is amazing, that the Congress and the president uh, frequently – violate the law and are operating com completely outside the constitution including judges that's amazing isn't it well that's that's what's happening and so check it out and uh check out the tea party and get involved you know something if you don't know what's going on find out what's going on you can't make a good decision i in the middle of the night last night we had a, some of the trauma intervention people were out on a call and they called me to get my opinion on something because they, and I suggested to them, although I didn't use these words, to do certain things and find out what's going on. I said, you can't make a good decision without good information. A lot of times we try to make a decision and we don't have all the facts. 
Well, I want to go back and talk to you for a few minutes about this, uh, the marijuana grows in California. I ran across yesterday a, an interesting article. I've talked a little bit about this topic before, but it was in Reuters, R-E-U-T-E-R-S. Uh, it was from the Reuters people, and they, are, they wrote an article, Banned Pesticides Showing Up in California Water. It's so fascinating because I, I've worked in agriculture on and off uh, starting in my teen years and then recently uh, as well. And so I had to follow the, the current rules uh, of agriculture, which is all kinds of rules on farming. And one is fertilizers that you use and how much you use and how you use it and and when you can use it and whether the wind's blowing and how hard it can be blowing and when you can burn and when you can't burn and burn permits and rules on burning. And then when you want to spray weed killers, how you can use it, how much you can use it and what you can use and, and on what crops and pesticides spraying bugs, when you can use it, how you can use it, whether it's legitimate on this crop, I can't, you can use it on this crop, but you can't use it on that crop. And you can't spray here if another crop is next door and it could get drift. And there's all kinds of rules and they've come up with all kinds of rules because of abuse. You know, lots of laws come about not because everybody's breaking them. It's just some people are breaking them. And so then they make laws that everybody has to follow and be punished by if they step outside of them just for a few lawbreakers. So, uh, what's happening is, is there's chemicals that aren't even being used anymore that are showing up in the waterways. And what this article says is there's an estimated 50,000 or more marijuana plots, not an individual marijuana plant, but a marijuana grow plot or a small farm in California, not the U S 50,000 in California. Now, the estimates in Yuba County, which is just one of 58 counties, is that there's over 1,000 or there are over 1,000 plots in Yuba County. And I can believe it because in just nosing around a bit, uh, I've, I've uh, put in the paper 20, 30, 40 plots myself. And through articles in the Territorial Dispatch, you can check that out at territorialdispatch.biz, biz. So this article talks about over 50,000 plots and, uh, and the estimate is that, um, even though voters legalized the drug, uh, pot last November, the state actually only expects 16,000 growers to seek licenses. Now, I don't know why they came up with that number. Uh, the fact is lots of growers aren't even, are, are just going to continue to do it unlawfully and not, you know, the state is like going to run this thing, right? The government takes over any of these things, right? Whether it's alcohol or cigarettes, they call them sin taxes. So in other words, they're going to say, oh yeah, you can do this. It's legal to do it, but we want to run it and we want to manage it. And we want to, we want our cut. It's kind of like the mafia, right? You start your own business, you take all the risks and the mafia comes in and says, well, you need a little protection. And so you pay us so much a week for protection. So they feel that only about 16,000 growers are expected to seek licenses when commercial cultivation becomes legal next year. In other words, this coming year, folks will be able to get commercial licenses to grow. Now, I think that's going to be dependent, of course, on county ordinances as well. The problem is that many of these illegal growers are using fertilizers and pesticides that are no longer even allowed in your normal agricultural activities. Uh, they're not only not allowed in California, they're banned in the United States. And one of them is called carbofuron. And another one is zinc phosphide. And, uh, so that's showing up in water. There's a, uh, I, in fact, I talked about this, I don't know, a few months ago about this, uh, guy that's specializing in, in 
tracking some of these chemicals and fertilizers that are coming off these growth sites that are being discovered. <clears throat> so this article says that the chemicals, illegal chemicals have turned thousands of acres of forest into waste dumps, toxic waste dumps that some law enforcement officers have actually become sick after inadvertently touching plants or equipment uh, that had the chemicals on them and scores of animals have died. So um, it says that streams in which the chemicals have been detected are crucial sources of water, obviously for fish, animals, and cattle, you know, domesticated animals, and people. Uh, This ecologist name, his name's Morad Gabriel, he works with law enforcement on marijuana contamination uh, issues. And he says there's a big problem. Carbofuron is in the water and it's not supposed to be in the water. So the symptoms of that chemical are headaches, nausea, dizziness, vomiting, uncontrollable muscle twitching, convulsions, and even death if you get enough of it on board according to the National Institute of Health. So the other chemical that is an interesting chemical, in fact, I remember buying this at one time, diazinon. And uh, just you could buy it over the counter uh, around to kill. I, th- I th- thought I used it to kill like ants and stuff, but I, it's been years ago and, it's, and now uh, I don't think it's easy to get. But somehow these uh, growers have it diazinon and this, uh, Mr. Gabriel has found diazinon also in streams and diazinon can cause difficulty in breathing, weakness, uh, general weakness, blue lips and blue fingernails, convulsions, and ultimately a coma. Pretty intense. So this Gabriel's visited more than a hundred sites in California and is widely considered one of the leading authorities on toxins at marijuana farms. So we just uh, saw where the Yuba County Sheriff's Department and their group has been raiding a number of these groups, uh, farms up in the uh, Yuba County foothills, some on public lands or what we call federal lands, um, and then some on private, but they've been finding these chemicals as well. So, uh, Gabriel, Mr. Gabriel said that half the streams he studied and eight watersheds in the state's prime pot growing regions tested positive for contaminants. So, um, in Kern County, I don't know whether you're familiar with Kern County. I've actually done some river rafting down in Kern County, um, white water rafting, but they discovered these chemicals I'm just mentioning, carbofuron and diazinon in uh, streams, uh, in the Kern County and central California area, Humboldt count Humboldt County over near the coast, Mendocino, North of Santa Rosa. Um, uh, so anyway, it's, it's a big problem. A lady named Patricia young from Shasta County had eight of her cows die, uh, after drinking from a contaminated stream. And, uh, they've, they found dead deer and elk, uh, and then they then they checked their livers. They've tested positive for these chemicals. So, uh, one of the investigators, uh, for one of the sheriff's departments said is, uh, one of his law enforcement dogs almost died from pesticide poisoning after jumping into a reservoir or a pond that was created to pump out of for an illegal grow. So, uh, and I, I think I mentioned earlier that a number of investigators going on these sites, you remember when, uh, I don't know if you remember when in Yuba County, Sutter County, particularly Yuba County, there were a lot of methamphetamine labs and those are very dangerous. In fact, we've had some, I've, I've actually seen photos of, uh, people that were using a methamphetamine lab when it, uh, something happened and the lab malfunctioned and gases were released that that immediately killed both of them here in Yuba County. I saw a photo of them dead 
in the lab. And uh, so I remember when law enforcement used to raid in methamphetamine labs, how dangerous it was because of the chemicals that were involved. So now we have this similar situation uh, where uh, this has actually become a risk factor for agents. Um, Matt St. John, who is executive officer of the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board in the heart of marijuana country, said his agency is planning to regulate pesticide use by marijuana farmers. I would just say to Matt, good luck, partner. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's easy to test a stream, but to get people that are already uh, specializing and violating the law, why would they care what they dump into the waterways? Uh, they're pretty much infecting themselves as they go along. So uh, anyway, this goes along with, you know, when you think about uh, if you're a Yuba County resident or Sutter County resident and you frequent some of the Yuba County uh, water sites, like I think of uh, Bullard's Bar Dam, Englebright or Englebright Reservoir, uh, M Collins Lake, Dry Creek, <clears throat> Yuba River. Those are all runoff spots from these grow spots. Uh, and, you know, some of these roads, uh, you'll find eight or ten grow spots right in a row. I just published that, I think, in the Territorial Dispatch up on Marysville Road. And uh, those those drain off into Merle Collins Reservoir right up there, it's just above Mary, uh, Merle Collins Reservoir. So uh, Buck Weckman's saying we need a state of emergency, and the board of supervisors are dragging their feet a bit. And uh, Buck saying, hey, uh, the board of supervisors didn't create this. It's sort of a perfect storm when lots of different decisions were made. Uh, whether it's by the legislature of the of the state, by voters, uh, the fact that naturally we can grow marijuana here better than most places in the world. And uh, so we have a problem that we need to manage. And uh, so we'll see uh, if you, as I mentioned earlier, you can call the Board of Supervisors, you can call Randy Fletch Fletcher uh, and let them know know what your feelings are but what what some of these guys this one uh investigator from up in trinity county or siskiyou county was saying uh, i'm not going to be drinking water out of those streams anymore I used to drink water because i thought this is pure country water up here but ain't gonna be doing that no more so maybe you're gonna maybe we're all just gonna stick to the bottled water so we'll be right back. we got a couple more hours to go, so stick with us if you want to. You know, California is just in trouble. I was talking, actually, a couple things happened. I was on Facebook, and I noticed a gal that was uh, used to be in the Yuba County Jail, and she's been a heroin addict, an opiate addict for years. And uh, I've been trying to get her to try something different. And uh, she's homeless uh, and uh, just sleeping in and out of hotels and stuff. So she was making a comment on Facebook how desperate she was. And uh, she was out of money, out of everything, and sick and trying to avoid the cops. All this was on Facebook. Kind of amazing, huh? Because cops can read Facebook too, so another guy that uh, that she knows used to run with, and I know, said right on on Facebook, "Hey, I got some oxys, O X Y S, and that's oxycontin, uh, which is a very powerful opiate. In other words, if you're having withdrawals, I can get you. I have oxys, and." Uh, you know, it was last night or the, maybe two nights ago, I was talking to Dr. Cassidy. He used to be the <clears throat> Yuba County's health officer for 20-something years and also served in the Yuba County Jail for many years and was the, the first person of the medical community to ever bring up the issue and the crisis of opiate addiction. And it seemed like it's been almost 20 years since he did that. And everybody else was just kind of ignoring it. 
And when he brought that up, it was kind of controversial, and he actually helped bring the first methadone clinic to town. And then he began also in his private practice uh, 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 prescribing Suboxone, which is another uh, product that can uh, stop withdrawals and help opiate addicts uh, wean themselves off the, off the problem. So I was talking to Dr. Cassidy the other night, and he said that he and uh, Dr. I think it's Nicole Quick, Dr. Quick, who is the new health officer for Yuba County, <clears throat> were planning on getting together for a meeting, maybe lunch or something. And I thought, oh, why is she wanting to get together with you? And he said, well, maybe because of the opiate crisis. I don't know whether you've been following this, but uh, things aren't getting better. And... Um, you know, last week we talked about the fact that in some counties there were more people registered to vote than there were adults that were qualified to vote. That's a bad sign, right? That means you aren't culling the, uh, the registration of uh, voters for folks that have either died or left the area or people that have registered fraudulently, Right. If you got too many voters compared to your adult population, it's a bad sign. Well, there's another uh, rule of thumb or a bad sign, and that is uh, if you have more prescriptions for oxycodone or hydrocodone, which is Norco's, or other opiates, uh than your population. Now, we just we just got finished tra- talking about Siskiyou and Trinity counties way up in the north state, north of Yuba and Sutter counties and Butte County, way up north, and how they're having a big problem with, with marijuana grows, right? And their uh, Sheriff Lopey up there declared us, asked the supervisor to declare a state of emergency, and they did. And they got the senator, Ted Gaines, up there to – to also write a letter. So now Trinity County also has, it's the fourth <clears throat> uh, smallest county, is the state's fourth smallest county, and uh, it ended last year. It says it has an estimated population of 13,628. Now Marysville has a population supposedly of right at 12,000. So that whole county has about the same, just a little bit more population than the city of Marysville. Now, the interesting thing about Trinity County that has 13,628 people in it. Now, that's all kinds of people. That's like people that are one day old. Well, if you look at it's, if you look at uh, the li- the number of prescriptions for oxycodone, hydrocodone, and other opioids like Vicodin, etc. They have 18,439 prescriptions. Now, prescription, like when I get a prescription of something, it's just one prescription. That's one prescription, and then you can renew the prescription. When you renew that prescription, it's still just one prescription. It doesn't multiply. So if you have 18,439 prescriptions of opioids for 13,629 people or 28 people, you got a big problem. Either people are double and triple subs- uh, prescribing, something screwy. Now, this article is about there's some counties in California that have way more prescriptions and they got people. Now it's one thing to have adults, right? I, this is counting kids and babies. So that shows you how far out of whack just little Trinity County is. When I was back in, um, uh, Portland, Maine, uh, at a tip conference, the, the, police chief, they had a huge epidemic of overdoses and deaths in that area. And the police chief had come on and and came in and spoke to the tip people from all over the country. But uh, this article talks about the fact that in West Virginia, Ohio, and rural New England, 
uh, they have these areas have become synonymous with prescription painkiller abuse. Uh, and and this uh, problem has been blamed for more than 183,000 deaths from 1999 to 2015. It's a huge problem back there, a huge problem. And it's in mainly in the rural areas. You think, oh, well, heroin abuse is all down the ghettos and all that kind of stuff. Not necessarily. In California, there were 1,925 opioid-linked overdose deaths in, in, in the state last year. And thousands and thousands of, of emergency room visits. Now, you can stop an opioid death if you can catch them quick enough. So, uh, it's the interesting thing is in, in these rural areas, the same areas that all this marijuana is being grown is, uh, it seems that there's a, the opi opioid problem is worse in the rural areas, just kind of like down in Appalachia. So here's some other counties in the state of California, those 58 counties in the state. So these are counties where there's more prescriptions of opi opioids on the books because we monitor things like that in the state of California. There's more prescriptions listed than there are people. So that's Lake County, Shasta County, Tuolumne County, and Del Norte County. Del Norte is where Pelican Bay Prison is, right up in the top corner, right on the ocean, right before you get into Oregon. Also, uh, in the Sacramento region, we have the same problem. In El Dorado County and Placer County, uh, Yolo County has above the state average in in, in uh, opioid prescriptions. So uh, it's interesting because you say, well, who's <coughs> who's involved in all this? I remember one time talking to Dr. Cassidy where he told me that in his practice of trying to get people off opioids, he actually had uh, representatives from every occupation in the community that had that a representative had had opioid problems. So whether you talk about teachers or firefighters or managers of retail stores or judges or whatever, right? Anybody can have that problem because they're, it's not just people start out wanting to be an addict. It people have, maybe they have a surgery and they begin taking painkillers and then they just keep taking them. So here's some tendencies. Demographic tendencies, large percentage of non-Hispanic whites, higher rates of uninsured and Medicaid enrollment, lower education atten attainment, higher rates of unemployment, small town status, more dentists and physicians per capita, mm. higher prevalence of diagnosed diabetes, arthritis and disability, and higher suicide rates. That's just talking about the communities that this is. Uh, a big problem in. So the National Institute of Drug Abuse last month awarded nine grants to address the opioid crisis in rural places. And one Oregon doctor, a guy named Todd Corthius, uh, is the only grant recipient west of the Mississippi River. And I thought, well, why wouldn't Yuba County get in? They, they always like to dip into money that Mr. and Mrs. Grant has. Why did they miss this? I think Dr. Cassidy, if he was over there, maybe that's why uh, Dr. Quick wants to talk to Dr. Cassidy. Maybe they're going to get together and get themselves a grant, see if we can help. Uh, but we got, we got big problems in this uh, narcotics thing. It says here that 40 people die of opioid overdoses every single day. Young people are among the biggest abusers, but uh, the highest prescription rate increase of opioids was the folks 70 to 74 years old. Man, I guess they, they don't feel so hot, so they're just going to get a buzz on. Pretty interesting. 
Uh, so there's money being made. I know the Trump administration has been, talk, been talking about this. California is going to get something like 40, $45 million of federal money for fighting this. So we'll see whether Yuba County is going to, like, tune in to get some, get some of this cash. So, hey, I don't know whether you uh, saw this or not, but, uh, you know, we had uh, two highway patrol officers shot and one Sacramento sheriff's deputy killed by uh, a parolee a little over a week ago, right? And then right during the funeral, two more, two more sheriff's uh, guys or either police or sheriff guys in Sacramento were shot. Does that, did that like surprise you? Uh, Oh, I'm looking for something here. Uh, so at, after the first, uh, three officers were shot, Uh, Senator Nielsen sent out a, uh, a summary of the guy that did the shooting and I'm trying to find it here and I'm having a difficult time finding it all of a sudden, but basically it listed, oh, here it is. Oh no, that isn't it. Anyway, this fellow who did the shooting was a parolee and, um, he, Actually, I don't even know why they were looking for this guy. I think they were looking for somebody else. But he started shooting before they even opened a door. And uh, and shot initially the two highway patrol officers. And then he shot the sheriff's deputy as he went out the back of the hotel room or whatever. So the San Francisco Chronicle uh, listed the previous offenses of this guy, uh, Mr. Little Cloud is his name. And let me just read them to you. Assault on officers and first responders. This is before this incident. Drug possession, robbery, grand theft, assault with stun gun, battery on emergency personnel, two counts of assault on police officers or firefighter, six counts of assault with, with or possession of firearms, federal indictment on charges of possession with intent to distribute methamphetamine, illegal possession of a firearm and ammunition, use using a counterfeit credit card and identity theft. Now you would think that if a, like a guy with that kind of background, Thomas Daniel Littlecloud, that he would still be locked up, but he got released. And so what Senator Nielsen, who represents Yuba and Sutter County was saying is he was complaining about the fact that, uh, this guy was out of jail and he blamed it on this it's he says in his news release uh this individual has been apprehended with firearms on multiple occasions he's talking about <clears throat> thomas daniel little cloud who ended up being shot and killed and then mr nielsen says senator nielsen says since the passage of assembly bill 109 and propositions 36, 47, and 57, criminals like Little Cloud now face diminished to no consequences. Diminished for you out in all of us, that means lesser, lesser problems. Smaller, diminished. Diminished to no consequences for their continued criminality. So Nielsen's saying, hey, 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 hey. If, if we didn't pass Assembly Bill 109 and propositions, Assembly Bill means that the sim, Assembly members passed that. That was called the Realignment Bill. I'll explain that in a second. But propositions are things that you and I pass. Those are on the ballot, Propositions 36, 47, and 57. And he says if those four things hadn't happened, we wouldn't have reduced the consequences for guys like Mr. Little Cloud who have been on a rage of, you know, of uh, criminal behavior for many years. So I got to thinking, I need to go back and look up what all those were. And then I got to thinking, I wonder if the counties up here in the state of Jefferson would have voted 
did they vote for this for those? You know, those are passed 36, 47, and 57 were all propositions reducing penalties on criminals. And I wondered, I wonder how State of Jefferson people voted. Maybe we voted the opposite of the state because we get outvoted all the time, right? But I got some surprises. I got surprised. And it wasn't, we didn't vote so different up here than, than folks in other spots. <laughs> In some cases. So in AB 109, that was where the federal courts said to Governor Brown, you got to let about 40 some thousand people out of prison and you figure out how to do it. So Governor Brown says, well, some of them we're just going to transfer down to the county level. And and we'll when they we give them prison sentences, some of them will get prison sentences at the county level. And some of the more serious ones will come over here to the state level. So that was AB 109. That's what they call a realignment. And then some people just got released early. And they monitor them at a local level as, as opposed to with parole agents. They use probation officers, right? There's a number of differences, but I, I don't have the time to totally tease out each one of these. But I want to explain to you that that was in 2011, AB 109. So then in 2012, uh, we have people that said, hey, this three, three strikes rule isn't fair. In other words, three strikes, three felonies, and you're out. So two of those felonies had to be a violent felony. But sometimes people that uh, misstate this will say this. They can have two violent felonies, and then they could steal a pack of gum, and go, and that's your third strike, and then they don't get out of prison forever. That's a lie. The third strike didn't have to be a violent felony, but it had to be a felony. But in Prop 36, they changed the rules on three strikes, and it made it um, easier on criminals. And I'm going to tell you what that is. And just Proposition 36 modifies the elements of California three strikes, which was approved by voters in 1994. And uh, so it revised the three strikes law to impose life sentence only when the new felony conviction is a serious or violent. So in other words, it said <clears throat> that third strike had to be <coughs> a serious or violent crime. And it authorized them to go back and resentence all previous offenders of three strikes things and let them out if they need to be let out. And so, in fact, I know a guy here in town. I just talked to him the other day. I, he said, I got let out on that three strikes revision. Okay. But let me tell you this over 60% of the people in the state of California, including people up here in the state of Jefferson voted to, to change that three strikes law. So na 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 na. if you're state of Jefferson, you think you're so different. You, you lightened up that three strikes law. Then we had proposition 47. And that was here in 2014. And uh, so let, let me get down here. And so that changed the classification of what uh, of non-serious and non-violent crimes. And it changed some from felonies to misdemeanors. And, uh, and so in that one, it was almost a sp split. It was 59% of the state voted to change and dumb down these crimes and change the way we looked at certain crimes. But in this one, uh, Del Norte, Lassen, Tehama, Calusa, Sutter, Yuba, El Dorado, Modoc, Shasta, Glen, Calaveras, and Amador, those are all Jefferson counties. They all voted. They didn't want Prop 47. So this is an instant, but some of them did. Siskiyou, Humboldt, Trinity, M Mendocino, Lake Butte, Plumas, Sierra, Nevada, Alpine all said we want to reduce the sentences on some crimes, that we are too tough on people. So in this case, the state of Jefferson on Prop 47, they kind of split. More, more, more counties said no than yes in the state of Jefferson of the 21 to 24 counties that kind of identify with the state of Jefferson. Um, but basically they, 
they dumbed down the, the criminal uh, penalties. The measure required misdemeanor sentences instead of felony for the following crime. Shoplifting, if it didn't in, uh, go over $950. Grand theft, if they if uh, the stolen property didn't over go over $950 in value. Receiving stolen property, if it didn't go over $950. Forgery. You could, they could steal your checkbook, steal $950, and it would be a misdemeanor. Fraud, if it didn't go over $950. Writing a bad check, if not over $950. Personal use of most illegal drugs, all misdemeanors. That's what Prop 47 did. We're going to take a break here and come back and talk about Prop 57, uh, sentencing parole reform, and just see how we've created some of the danger for our own police officers. The invisible hand is a phrase that was introduced by Adam Smith in his great book, The Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith's flash of genius was to see how prices that emerged in the market, the prices of goods, the wages of labor, and the cost of transport, could coordinate the activities of millions of independent people, strangers to one another, without anybody telling them what to do. His key idea was that self-interest could produce an orderly society benefiting everybody. In the middle of the 19th century, when Japan ended her self-imposed isolation and entered the modern age, it never occurred to her leaders to follow any other course than that of free enterprise and free markets. The adoption of mass production techniques meant that workers were able to move out of the traditional industries and into the new industries, which all added to the trade boom. In 1948, when India achieved independence, this is not the kind of life the government intended to perpetuate, but it is one result of their policy. By subsidizing the cotton that the villagers spin and the cloth that they weave, they made it difficult for modern industry to develop. Central planning in practice has condemned India's masses to poverty and misery. Why don't governments learn? Because governments never learn. What we need are constitutional restraints on the power of government to interfere with free markets in foreign exchange, in foreign trade, in many other aspects of our lives. History provides lots of evidence on what happens when government protected industries compete with industries who have to operate in an open and free market. Well, this isn't just demagoguery, though it is that. It's also nonsense. Whatever you think of the effects of DACA, no administration could continue it because it's illegal. U.S. immigration laws are pretty straightforward. If you're in the country illegally, you're supposed to leave. If you think that's mean or counterproductive or unfair, take it up with your legislators. Only Congress can change the law. The president is bound to faithfully enforce the laws of the United States. He or any president can simply invalidate those he doesn't like. Former Cabinet Secretary Gutierrez doesn't think this is a meaningful distinction, but if you want to live in a constitutional democracy where laws are more powerful than men, nothing is more important than that. But to our leaders, there is indeed something more important than that. Political power. They've concluded that mass immigration means new and reliable voters, and that means more power for them. If they need to subvert the rule of law to get that power, they will, and they have. In states across the country, politicians now actively boast about ignoring the law. They unilaterally declare federal statutes invalid in their cities. They bar ICE agents from buildings. They give driver's licenses and in-state college tuition to people who are here illegally. They refuse to prosecute immigrants for crimes that have nothing to do with immigration, in effect giving preference to illegals over their own citizens. All right. Most of the money we've made. Federal aid. The money's yours and mine. Hold that thought. Hey, I wanted to uh, just say this before we get away from the federal aid song and get back to our uh, reasons we're getting cop shot is that when you look at this entire system that is now perverted from what the founding fathers designed, which is taking all our money and sending it to Washington and then electing representatives to go and get it back. Our taxes really don't change if we don't get some of it back. That's what's corrupting about the whole thing. So a guy or a gal campaigns and he or she promises 
that she's going to get or he's going to get that corridor made two lane to four lane or that dam built or something something fixed or this new building put up or they're going to get some of that money that has been taken from us back so you vote for that person because whether or not they're going to get anything back you still are going to pay the same amount on your taxes right so the whole thing is so perverted that you actually vote for the person that's going to work the system the best, not change the system, not reduce our taxes and quit using this uh, corrupted way of the government takes your money, supports a massive white collar welfare system called the federal bureaucracy. And then you go back and beg for money to fix things at the local level. Like right now we're, begging them to give us money to fix dams and fix the river and fix the levees and all that kind of stuff. We beg them to give, it was our money to start with. So if we don't support the guy or the gal that, that says, I'm going to get your money back, I'm going to get you, I'm going to fund that project. Like if you go to where Harry Reed, you know, Harry Reed, Senator of Nevada for many, many years and was speaker of the, of the Senate. Um, uh, when you go to, I don't know if you've been up to Reno lately, but that's nice up there. He got all kinds of money for Reno. I haven't been down to Las Vegas, but the freeways are amazing and federal dollars coming down there. I want to just, uh, piggyback on a commercial there for trauma intervention that Santos just played. By the way, we got Santos in the, the house today, w- wiki man. And we got, uh, Robert E. Leon Lampkin riding shotgun back there just watching over us both making sure we behave and he's getting ready to head what do you where you what a state you're going to out arkansas arkansas or arkansas is where he's going and uh, this is his last day and so he just kind of just sitting back there grinning just watching making sure we do everything right and uh so but santos played this uh tip uh clip which uh, doesn't get any government aid, no federal aid, no state, no county, no city. And trauma intervention uh, has done over 10,000 911 responses to help citizens in Yuba and Sutter County since we started in December 94 and helped law enforcement and fire and the hospital system out, taking some pressure off those folks so they could do their job. And uh, this time of year, we try to raise some money and we – for 12 of the last 23 years, we had a dinner, and then we, uh, our firefighter caterer moved to Oregon to be a firefighter for the city of Roseburg, Oregon. And, uh, and then the, this is amazing. This is even more amazing, although I hated to see my friend Dave New- Newquist move, uh, who was our caterer and very kind to tip for many, many years. You can imagine he cooked 12 dinners in a row and it hardly charges anything for him. Uh, so, but the other thing that was interesting happened the last two years, we'd, we'd used the St. Isidore Catholic church multipurpose facility, which is really a wonderful facility and it benefited the whole community. Lots of nonprofits utilized it big old gymnasium and and dinner area and really just a one of the best facilities in the whole community for a gathering and had a big kitchen and lots of parking very nice and they're very nice to to work with but all of a sudden the state of california told the diocese of cal uh, catholic diocese of california you cannot use your facilities and rent them out to the public. You can't do that and keep your nonprofit status, which I think is totally wrong, but I'm not any priest and I'm not involved in the Catholic church. I don't have any say, but we, so we had a real inexpensive uh, facility there because they gave us a, a special deal because of our work in our, in the community. So we lost our venue and our, and our uh, 
dinner provider. So we decided to go another way. And so uh, we're just doing a straight up fundraiser. If you if you believe in tip, you like what we do, and you want to help out a little bit, even if you had ten dollars, we would we would be much appreciated. So we're kind of just doing y'all help us. And uh, then we're going to do an online auction. We're, we're actually doing an online and an old style auction, old school auction where we've got a gun. We we're uh, we're going to sell tickets to, and we're trying to get some airline tickets to see if we can get some round trip tickets. Like before we do a jet blue or, or a uh, Southwest air ticket raffle. So if you want to help tip, if you don't know much about trauma intervention, you can go to our website. If you say, I never heard of this. What is it? You can go to Yuba Sutter tip, all one word, Yuba Sutter tip.org. And you can check us out and you can give there, or you can go to you caring.com Y O U caring, all one word.com backslash T I P. And you'll find out how to give there, or you could just send us a check at PO box six, four, five. P.O. Box 645 Marysville. That's tip. P.O. Box 645 Marysville. And you can help us. Actually, uh, a lot of people can get involved in this that couldn't necessarily come to the dinner before. Maybe the dinner wasn't at the right time or it was a more, more than you could afford or you couldn't afford to buy a table or you couldn't afford to buy an individual ticket, but maybe you could give $5, $10. And, uh, but a little bit helps. And so all our money and tip goes to help train our folks and to provide uh, client resources for those that are going through the most difficult time of their life. Either they, their loved one died or their house burned down or something really terrible has happened. So you can help keep us going and fund our operation. So you can imagine we have technology, we have cell phones that communicate with the 911 system and and all kinds of literature and training that we do. So if you can help through yubasuttertip.org or youcaring.com backslash tip or tip P.O. Box 645 Marysville, much appreciated. Well, uh, I was talking about Senator Nielsen's news release, and he was uh, despairing over the loss of life and the wounding of officers. And even since that time, two more officers have been wounded in Sacramento. And he was uh, despairing over the fact that the gentleman, uh, maybe I'm, that's a loose term for this guy, this character uh, that, that did the shooting shouldn't have been out of prison and he was out of prison because of these various propositions that I mentioned 36 47 and 57 that have been voted on by you and I now I happen to vote against all three of them but you may have voted for some of them. in fact a majority of voters in California voted for all three and so what Senator Nielsen is saying is we've inflicted this thing on ourselves. Now, AB 109 isn't the, isn't the same. AB 109 was voted on in the assembly. That's assembly bill. That's what AB stands for. And so that vote pretty much was on party line. In other words, the Democrats voted for that and the Republicans voted against it. So whatever flavor you are, I'm not really caring today. I'm saying that on, I, I mentioned now 36 was a, the redefining of the three strikes law passed by 60%, over 60%. Prop 47, which was criminal, criminal sentence reductions. In other words, looking at sentences and said, oh, I think that's too much for that crime. We're going to reduce it and we're going to retroactive it and let people out of prison. That was Prop 47. That passed with 59%. And, uh, and both of those, a good portion of this, the counties in the, state, in the state of Jefferson supported that idea. And then you have this final one that I was getting to before we took a break, and that was Prop 57. And that was sentencing parole reforms. And that was to make 
make it possible where, where guys and gals that were in prison could get out sooner by good behavior, getting their high school education, uh, completing rehabilitation programs, etc. They could work their way out of prison, essentially, right? So uh, that passed in 2016. And actually, that is just still being implemented, and some of the regulations on that are still passing. Now, on this one, I, I again, I told you I, I got interested in this because when Nielsen wrote this news release, I thought, well, I wonder who voted for against and for those because I voted against all of them, but I don't know how those other folks did. And I wondered if the big cities and the big population areas like L.A. and Riverside County, San Bernardino County, and San Diego County voted for all these. And all us up here, well, we got like Trinity County that has just 13,000 people in it, if they all voted against them, right? But not, not exactly. So on this sentencing parole reform, 63.8% supported that in the whole state. But it's interesting how uh, Del Norte... Modoc, Lassen, Shasta, Trinity, Tehama, Glen, Calusa, and Amador, they didn't want that. But here down in Yuba Duba and Sutter County, we voted for sentencing parole reform. So bad on us. If you want to complain about Mr. Lightcloud, who just killed an officer, a deputy, and wounded two officers, I wonder if maybe he wouldn't have been affected by this since it's just it's just happening now but this type of thing is what is letting folks like him out of prison so these counties in in what i call the state of jefferson siskiyou humboldt mendocino lake uh, butte plumas sutter yuba sierra placer el dorado alpine calaveras uh they supported that so up here in the state of jefferson we think we're a lot different I think we are a lot different than the rest of the state, actually, on a lot of issues. We're a lot different. But it's interesting how we weren't so different on these three issues that may have created a real predicament. Now, it's interesting. Sacramento, in two weeks, has five officers shot in two separate instances. That That's a big mouthful right there. And that should... Uh, get our attention in terms of like, uh, you know, like this guy I was telling about, he was three strikes. He was down for the count, this guy. Uh, and I just, uh, uh, he was actually with me the other day. We were speaking at juvenile hall. This guy got a, a clearance to go into juvenile hall from the district attorney. And, uh, and this guy, uh, after five years of serving his, for his life term, third strike, uh, he, he got a wake up call and he got totally converted and, uh, he'd had some experience in church before, but he, he went through a major conversion and for the next years of his term, he totally changed his life up and lived a redeemed life in prison. And so when his term, when his time to be assessed and looked over, um, they, they released him. And they, they said, you're good to go. And so now he's not doing good stuff in the community and working and paying taxes and married and got married and he's living a good life. Did you see, you guys see where that one of the Charlie Manson group is up for parole? Van Houten, Van Houten, I can't remember her first name. Leslie, Leslie Van Houten. And uh, none of these Manson people have been released, but she, the parole board has said, we're willing to let you out, but governor Brown's got to okay it. And so he hasn't okayed it before. So, uh, it was interesting. I was reading an article last night about it and, uh, she'd been locked up. Uh, she's 68 years old and she's been locked up since 1969. And, uh, so some of those, uh, Manson gang people are actually dying in prison now. And, uh, but per pretty interesting thing. Uh, so I, I want to get down here and, uh, see if I can find, 
there's an article that is pretty amazing. It, it's amazing, and, and, and I guess it isn't, uh, if I can find it here. You know, we've been talking about this uh, Sutter Butte flood control committee, Sabufka, right? And they went out in about 2010 and, and got enough support to get, uh, I'm talking while I'm scrolling here, to get down to this article that I want to compare. Maybe I can't find this article. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the Sutter Butte's Flood Control Agency, they wanted to rebuild all these levees because they needed to. The levees along the Feather River, Sutter County, were in, were in bad shape. And so, um, hold on just a second. Let me see if I can get down to here. Uh, so, anyway, they got over 30,000 parcels of people to vote, right? To vote to tax themselves for over 30 years. And... Uh, When they did that, the re the way they did that is they got the Sutter Buttes or the uh, Sutter Tea Party or sorry, the uh, Sutter Taxpayers Association to to support that if they would have a citizens committee overseeing the handling of the funds, and so they agreed to that to get the support of this of this group. And so they, everything got passed and the money started coming in and they went out and got the federal funds and the levees started being built and the levees have been being worked on for low these many years. But, uh, an advisory group, if it's doing its job, uh, began to, uh, find, problems with the way that the Sutter Butte's Flood Control Agency was handling the money, and they criticized it. And then that ticked people off. So um, pressure began to be brought upon a couple of the ladies that were on the oversight committee, and Elaine Miles, who had been a auditor for the state of California for – her career, she was uh, discharged in her duty as the new president of the council. And then a, a former teacher, Roberta Fletcher, was pressured and she quit. And so recently the Sutter Butte Flood Control Board uh, voted, I think it was seven to two, to eliminate this council that they didn't really need it. They didn't need any oversight. Why? Because they're such wonderful people. That's why. And so, um, some of the folks in the community began to raise a stink about that because they don't trust government. Now I want you to think about all the agencies and your politicians to see whether, and I want, you to just think of all the corruption and the misuse of funds and the waste of funds and telling you one thing and doing something else. I want you to think of all those situations and then wonder if you think that a board telling you, you can trust us. We're wonderful people. In fact, I just saw the other day, I didn't read the article cause I can't subscribe to the I don't subscribe to the newspaper, but I read this article where Larry Munger said uh, he's one of the uh, supervisors and he's on the board of this uh, Sutter Buttes Flood Control Agency. He was complimenting himself about how wonderful the agency was. I always get a kick when people uh, say nice things about themselves, like a radio station that says we're number one. 
I would think, well, maybe other people ought to decide whether you're number one or not. Maybe they would decide you're number three. But anyway, I got a kick out of Larry Munger, who he's famous for calling the dollar store people the effers uh, because they wanted to have a business in the same town he wanted to have a business. In other words, Sutter is only big enough for Mr. Munger, not anybody else. So anyway, uh, the Sutter Buttes flood control people said, listen, we're just as transparent, as honest as the day is long, and you can trust us. And, you know, this – this." Uh, this group of people that are overseeing us, this citizens group, they weren't meeting anyway, and none of their people were showing up, but they did. They failed to tell the public that, uh, that they had actually pressured people to leave the group, right, and then never appointed new folks to take over. So anyway, I'm gonna t- uh, we're coming to the end of our second hour. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and then tell you about an important meeting coming up Oh, we got two, we got two minutes. Okay. I may be able to get to this then. Uh, so anyway, there's a meeting coming up. I believe it's just this week. I'm just pulling up now, September 13th. Is that Wednesday? And, um, it's at the city council chambers in Yuba city. And that's right off the corner of Butte house road and civic center Boulevard. It's at 1 PM and you can go there and Item number six on the agenda is whether or not <laughs> to bring back this citizens advisory committee because they already voted to get rid of it. But people said, hey, what's up? You promised, right? And uh, <clears throat> and we don't necessarily trust the way you're handling money and you're not that transparent. So uh, I'm going to make a few more comments because I'm trying to find this article here about another agency of the federal government that's totally gone berserk and it's just like this situation locally. We'll be right back. I had a great story recently, uh, I love telling it, of a little girl who was uh, in a drawing lesson. She was six and she was at the back drawing and the, the teacher said this little girl hardly ever paid attention. And in this drawing lesson she did. And uh, the teacher was fascinated. She went over to her and she said, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl said, they will in a minute. Anyway, Julie and I had lunch one day. I said, how'd you get to be a dancer? And she said, it was interesting. When she was at school, she was really hopeless. And the school in the 30s wrote to her parents, said, we think Gillian has a learning disorder. She couldn't concentrate. She was fidgeting. I think now they'd say she had ADHD. Wouldn't you? But this was the 1930s, and ADHD hadn't been invented, you know, at this point. So it wasn't an available condition, you know, people... (laughs) People, people weren't aware they could have that. <laughs> anyway, she sent, went to see this, um, this specialist. So this oak panelled room, and, and she was there with, uh, with her mother, and she was led and sat on this uh, chair at the end, and she sat on her hands for 20 minutes while this man talked to her mother about all the problems Gillian was having at school. And at the end of it, um, because she was disturbing people, her homework was always late and so on, a little kid of eight. In the end, uh, the... Uh, the doctor went and sat next to Gillian and said, Gillian, I've listened to all these things that your mother's told me. I need to speak to her privately. So she said, he, he said wait here, we'll be back. We won't be very long. And, and, uh, and they went and left her. But as they went out the room, he turned on the radio that was sitting on his desk. And when they got out the room, he said to her mother, just stand and watch her. And um, the minute they left the room, she said she was on her feet, moving to the music. And they watched for a few minutes, and he turned to her mother, and he said, you know, Mrs. Lynn, Gillian isn't sick. She's a dancer. <laughs> Take her to a dance school. I said, what happened? I said, she did. I can't tell you so how wonderful it was. We walked in this room, and it was full of people like me. People who couldn't sit still. People who had to move to think. Who had to move to think. They did ballet, they did tap, they did jazz, they did modern, they did contemporary. She was eventually auditioned for the Royal Ballet School. She became a soloist. She had a wonderful career at the Royal Ballet. She eventually graduated from the Royal Ballet School, found found her own company, the Gillian Dance Company, met Andrew Lloyd Webber. She's been responsible for some of the most successful musical theatre productions in history. She's given pleasure to millions, and she's a multimillionaire. Somebody else might have put on medication and told her to calm down. Sutter uh, Butte, uh, again, not Sutter Butte, that would be the mountain range, but uh, the two counties of Sutter and Butte, the flood control agency, that's been overseeing hundreds of millions of dollars, your dollars, 
not the government's dollars, your dollars. And people say, well, some of it came from the government. You know something? You need to just think through what you just think right there. Because all the money that there is was your money at one time. So whether it came from Department of Water Resources, the federal government matched up with your assessment you're paying every year for the next 30 some years, that's all your money. Just came out of a different pot. So that money, hundreds of millions of dollars, now after the Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency promised to have an oversight committee, now they said, well, we really never needed that all along because you can just trust us. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, and I want you to think about another instance where we've been just trusting people, and that's the Oroville Dam. And we just, we just came uh, within a heartbeat of flooding out and killing a lot of people and destroying hundreds of thousands of acres and miles of land, destroying our river, because of some incompetence that has been going on for decades at the state of California and the federal government. We're talking to about people that are engineers that are supposed to be, they're getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're supposed to be looking out for our safety. The article says in the appeal Democrat quote, all there in the files, End of quote. Oroville Dam investigators say inspectors missed the clues. In other words, they're saying that the clues were in the files in their offices all along. And they, they castigate the inspectors for just driving up there to Oroville, walking around, looking at the place, but not looking at the files, not looking at at the way the dam was constructed and maybe the dam was constructed inferior in an inferior way to what we now expect. And maybe we should make changes. It says that they uh, relied too heavily on visual inspections, ignored blueprints, construction records, and other documented clues that could have warned them about the dam's troubled flood control spillway long before it fractured in February. I want to ask you, Who is watching over these people? You think, oh, we don't need anybody. We are educated. We are your fellow community members. We care for you. I can't say on the radio what I feel about all this baloney. It says in the paper, the fracture led to near catastrophe and the evacuations I think the evacuation was about 200,000 people. I want you, I figured up how many hundreds of millions of dollars were lost just in what people spent to leave and lose work and pay to stay in hotels and eat at restaurants because of stupidity and ignorance and think we don't need anybody looking over our shoulder. We're the inspectors. It says, the team says the fracture was likely caused by a long-standing problems with cracks in the concrete and faulty drainage systems underneath the concrete chute that was too thin in many places, and on and on and on. Very simply explained here, there were flaws in the original design. Honestly, I could go on and on, but I don't have all day to talk about this. My point is that's one situation right there. I want to talk about another thing that government created. Again, the Sabufka board, Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency was created to protect and help people, right? I want to talk about what they call, what they called in Washington, D.C., the hardest hit fund. In other words, the hardest hit are people who were the hardest hit by the downturn in the economy, and they were unable to pay their mortgages. It was called, or it is called, it still exists today, the hardest hit fund to help struggling homeowners. Barack Obama created this, and this hardest hit fund operated under the Treasury Department. And through the government's own investigators, They found uh, 
in this multi-billion dollar program launched by Obama to help families hit by housing crisis, they squandered or wasted or blew millions of dollars. How did they, what did they spend that money on? Did they spend too much on copying machines and they overspend on automobiles? No, they spent it on parties, employee bonuses, cars, unneeded data storage. The findings of the latest probe were released this month by the Inspector General looking at the Troubled Asset Relief Program called TARP. You remember TARP? Right at the beginning of the Obama administrations. Government at its best, going to save the world, going to save the government's ailing financial institutions and, and pay money so people wouldn't lose their houses. Let me, let me tell you how, where a lot of the money went. 500, I'm not going to give you the dollar. I'm just going to give you the big dollars. 598,000, half a million dollars went to car allowances, free parking, and other transportation perks. 342,000 was spent on settlements, severance, and other employee legal expenses. In other words, employees that were dis, dissatisfied and left and sued said, darn it, I didn't like you anyway. I want, I want you to pay for my hurt feelings. 342000 went to employee bonuses, cash debit cards, gifts, and other perks. 258000 were spent on avoidable, in quotes by the people that investigated them, avoidable data storage expenses. 150000 went on barbecues, parties, picnics, steak, and seafood dinners, and other food and beverages. Another large amount of money was spent on a customer center in Rhode Island that already received federal money years earlier for the same office. The inspector general said taxpayers are paying more for this program than is necessary and losing federal dollars to waste because the treasury is not following its own contract to limit TARP spending to only expenses necessary to modify loans and demolish blighted houses. That's all that money was for is to help modify loans to keep people in their houses <coughs> and, to, and to demolish blighted houses. It was not for parties, picnics, barbecues, car perks. So the Treasury, against the rules, ended up allowing the state agencies to charge TARP for expenses not included in the permitted expenses, such as food and beverages, which are not necessary to modify loans or demolish houses. The probe was requested by a U.S. Senator in the aftermath of a 2016 audit exposing $8.1 million in waste in just one state's fund, Nevada's. In that case, the money was blown on outrageous things like employee outings, staff lunches, gifts, parties, fancy car for the supervisor, and severance pay for a top official. The Treasury Department never bothered trying to recover the money, according to the audit. In other words, each state was getting a portion of this, these billions, and the Treasury was not overseeing. this. The Treasury are employed by the government by us, right, the Treasury Department was supposed to oversee, oversee all these states' money that was supposed to just modify loans and destroy blighted houses. That was it. Not go for all this other crap. The government contributed more than $9 billion to the cause, and the money will uh, is to continue to be given out till 2020 in the Obama administration's last year, the fund got an additional $2 billion to assist struggling homeowners and communities. It says like a lot of government programs during the Obama's eight years, this one ballooned and kept receiving boatloads of cash with virtually no oversight. Let's see. I think the, the, uh, citizens, 
uh, group, KDAC, was supposed to provide oversight of Sutter Butte Federal, but or Sutter Butte Levy Commission, uh, so or the flood control group. So here's the thing: somehow the local county people are of a of a higher breed of people. They're actually honest. They don't sleep with each other. They don't take money that shouldn't belong to them. They don't use bad language and cuss people out when they when the mic's off. They're special people. They don't have a sin nature. You know, like hogs have a different nature from a dog. Humans, the Bible says, have a sin nature, and they tend to just go corrupt if, if you don't keep them on a short leash. Did you know that that's why the police are in the Bible, to keep people on a short leash? Because people do stupid stuff when they're not looking. The, this, this thing, uh, the hardest hit initiative started off with $1.5 billion focused on five states and it grew to 9.6 billion boondoggle encompassing 18 states and Washington DC. California received the biggest chunk of money, 2 billion, 358 million, 593,000. Followed by Florida, then Ohio, then Michigan, then North Carolina. Nevada got a total of 202 million. No oversight. And so people just went, did barbecues, gave bonuses. People were getting paid more than they should have. They got fancy cars. They got personal use of cars. There wasn't anything in that budget to include that stuff. And they just did it anyway. Why do you need oversight? Because people are dishonest. People by their very nature are dishonest and look out for their own best interest. The Bible says we should always look out on the interest of others, but people, when left to themselves, you know, a lot of people say, I hate the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't like this religious stuff. That even sounds more dangerous to me. I mean, I know there's corruption in the church, but when you say, oh, I don't need all that, I, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. Like the guy that sits in the bar and drinks all night, then says, oh, yeah, I got this. I can drive home. So when people say to me, you can trust us, oh, I, I got all kinds of red flags going on when, when, I, when people say, you can trust me. You know, in business or with your children or with the government, what you expect, you better inspect. That's why I always wonder when teachers say, we don't need no stinking tests. The kids can learn, and that'll be the end of it. I, I'm interested in what did exactly did the kids learn at the end of all that time they spent over there with you. What you expect, you inspect. Or as the Air Force likes to say, in God we trust, all others we monitor. Now, what's wrong with that? Now, if they're short of people on the citizens assessment group, why don't they just bring back Elaine Miles and Roberta Fletcher and let them get back into their seats and ask hard questions? You know, part of the assessment or an oversight group is to ask hard questions and then you answer them to the best of your ability. It's amazing to me. Have you noticed how many inquiries there are at the federal level about the past administration? And about Clinton, that's what we call oversight. Why we why would we have to do that? Because there's all kinds of money missing. There's emails missing. There's computers missing. Right? There's technology missing. There's people stole money. That's why we need oversight. So, uh, this meeting. This coming week on Wednesday, I want you to just go in there and have those uh, board members at Sutter Butte Flood Control Outfit ask, answer some hard questions about their personal lives, right? Did they ever sleep around? Are they trustworthy, right? 
Why? Why should I, I would want to know why should they we trust you? I think one of them. I was at a meeting one night. He was drunk or drunk. He couldn't even drive home. He was so drunk. Made a fool of himself. Why should I trust him? Why should I trust somebody that when the mic off calls Dollar General effers? Why should I trust another person who sl sleeps with uh, one of the people that funds all their political campaigns? Why should we trust that person? And even if we didn't know anything about him, what's wrong? It's just when I was on the board of Yuba County Office of Education, uh, it, by law, we had to have a CPA firm come in and uh, and do a complete audit and and do a report of findings, which then we had to accept or reject as a uh, school board. And then the the Office of Education had to then gave, give us a list of of remedial efforts that they would make to correct any findings that the uh, CPA group was concerned about findings of how they handled money and how they handled, uh, uh, you know, a paper trail of money and how they kept their inventory and how they handled the sale of old vehicles and et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that things were done, uh, above, you know, with all scrutiny and uh, above any reproach or suspicion. Because why? Because it's not our money. It's the public's money. Maybe we should have a full list of all the salaries of all the people of Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency. And uh, instead of one of these things, what I don't like is just where people can just come and ask questions and then you have politicians just give you a, uh, a shovel full of BS. I like to see documents and audits and lists of who's getting paid what and what kind of benefits they have. Let's see it for everyone to see if we can publish it in the paper, not just answer a few questions. So this Wednesday, 1 o'clock, uh, go check it out. Yuba City City Hall, that's the corner. It's kind of a, still a modern-looking building at the corner of Civic Center Boulevard and Butte House Road. And uh, you ought to go check it out and... Uh, if you live in Sutter County or Butte County, you should go ask questions. It's your money, you or, you or your property, if you come to pass or you move, your property is going to be paying that money for the next 30-some years. If the federal government and the state government, for goodness sakes, the, the state auditors came in and found that Caltrans had 3,500 people they didn't need, How would you like nobody to ever look at anything and make any evaluation of anything? I mean, we're talking about not an outside organization. These are state agencies and federal agencies that are looking into agencies and finding all kinds of problems with them and waste. I'm not talking about one or two people, 3,500 employees. I want you to think of what local business in the Yuba Sutter area has 3,500 employees. That's a lot of people, and a lot of those folks are making a hundred grand a year. We don't need any observation. We don't need any like assessment. We don't need any oversight. We don't need any advice. We don't need any critics. We just do whatever we want. Crazy, totally crazy. Well, um, hey, I want to before we we got another thirty minutes here, but I want to give another shout out for the uh, for you guys that are. You, you need to be ta doing something. You should go on the whitehouse.gov site and send Trump an email. You need to get involved with the Tea Party. Uh, you need to write your legislator. You need to stand up for things like the Orville Dam situation and some of these. Uh, honestly, we need to do something about these cop shootings. And uh, Senator Nielsen is right on the right on the money of, of expressing his concern about these watering down of, of, um, the punishment of crime. So, um, go out and 
try your hand at the tea party. And the next meeting is coming up on the 18th, 630. And you can get there at 6. I think the doors open. There's usually some refreshments. No cost to go. Just go check it out and see if you can meet some new friends and get involved. And they meet twice a month. So we'll be back in a, a minute. I don't have vocabulary for it, but for someone to compare trying to live by your faith to person who brought on the Holocaust or to slave owners is just, it's insulting. It's ridiculous. I don't have the words for it, but it's wrong. By now, most people are familiar with these cases involving bakers and florists and photographers who have declined to provide their services for same-sex weddings because of their religious beliefs. I serve everybody. I just don't make cakes for every event. It's never the, the people. It's always the event that I look at it and say, I can't do that. One of the most famous cases involves a Colorado baker named Jack Phillips, and his case is actually going before the Supreme Court. But what most people don't know are some of the pretty terrible allegations that had been made against him, both through the public and even by a government official. One of the commissioners on the Colorado Civil Rights Commission called religious freedom despicable rhetoric and compared not making a cake to slavery and the Holocaust. That was particularly offensive to me because my dad fought in World War II. He landed on Omaha Beach, Normandy. He fought across France. He fought across Germany. He ended up being part of a group that helped liberate Buchenwald concentration camp. And for her to compare not making a cake to the Holocaust, knowing what my dad went through, was just ludicrous and personally offensive. When we opened the bakery initially, and from the first day I got the key, he came in like every day. So I made sure that he had coffee and muffins and I got to sit down and get to know my dad better. This part talks about Buchenwald. Americans, British, and French broke through Hitler's the right they discovered. Uh, the Nazi atrocities in the concentration camps and mentions Buchenwald in the book. That's where he was, but Dachau, Bergen Belsen, Auschwitz, Ravensbrück. Says the Nazi atrocities were understatements, and he circled it and said, "This is true." It was there. The smell was horrible. Do you think he would be proud of you for standing up in the way you are? I think he would. I know my dad would be proud of what's going on. I'm saying him. I'm sure he would be upset with the way the government is treating the freedoms that he fought for. Jack's father is actually buried in a military cemetery just five minutes away from his bakery, so we are coming here to pay him a visit. My situation has nothing to do with the Nazis. It has nothing to do with racism. I want to run my bakery in a way that everybody who comes in is welcome. I don't care what their political persuasions are. God created lots of people. <laughs> created every one of them, and he wants us to show his love to them. All these soldiers, they fought for these freedoms. And it's not just me and you know my issue. It's for every American. They didn't sacrifice all this just to see it wasted away. I want to play a clip here in a few minutes about uh, the title of it is Why is Health Insurance So Complicated? I want to just propose to you that whatever portion of our society we want to turn over to government will become very complicated. In some countries, the food supply is managed by government and there isn't enough of it. If, if you look at uh, any, uh, in a communist or socialist country, anything that the government is managing, they run short of it. If you want to turn over the fuel supply, you're going to run short of it. The government more and more is involved in restricting 
energy exploration, so we have a shortage of it. So we, do you remember brownouts in the state of California? All of a sudden, all the power would go down in large portions of the state. There's shortage of electricity in some areas. There's there's fuel shortages in other areas. We've had fuel shortages under President Carter. We don't have a shortage of anything in this country unless government gets involved and then it becomes a shortage. And so when you look at, if you wanted, like, I don't know the last time you've gone to the grocery store and they were completely out and they may have been out of your brand, but they weren't out of the product, whether it was bread or vegetables or fruits or whatever, whatever. But when you, What you hear today regarding health care is they can't get health care. They can't get the doctor they want. They can't get that surgery. They can't get that uh, x-ray paid for, et cetera. Why is that? There's one simple reason. It's the government is involved, and it's controlling it. So whether it's medicine or water or oranges or tires for your car or education, uh, any of those things could be just as screwed up as health care if you turn it over to the government. If you turned over the orange, growing of oranges and distribution of oranges, it would be a fiasco. It would be way too expensive. They would be half rotten, and you couldn't get oranges year-round. I'll guarantee it. The government cannot manage it. They can't manage hardly anything. And so I just read you about Obama's fiasco in trying to hit, trying to help people called the hardest hit homeowners. And it ended up being a total boondoggle of waste and ripoffs by dishonest people. Employees that are supposed to be serving you and me that are ripping off that money. So I want to play this clip and it, it will help educate you because I think sometimes you think, well, it's just the way health care is. It's just a real complicated mess. It isn't the way it is. If they privatized and got con- to- totally out of it, it would be like all other products are, easy to get. Americans carry many different forms of insurance. There's car insurance, home insurance, life insurance, even pet insurance. Most of these insurance policies work well and are fairly priced. But there is one glaring exception, health insurance. Only health insurance becomes more complicated and more expensive at the same time. So the obvious question is, why? To answer this question, we have to start at the beginning. What is insurance? It's pretty straightforward. You pay a monthly fee which provides financial protection against unforeseen, sometimes catastrophic events. People buy homeowner's insurance, for example, to protect themselves from the financial loss incurred in the event of a fire, a flood, or theft. Because millions of people are paying into the insurance pool, the pool has enough money to cover the unlucky person whose house does burn down. And since insurance is meant to share risk, it only stands to reason that higher risk individuals have to pay more to be insured. Someone who has had two accidents is going to pay more for car insurance than someone who has never had an accident. Why? Because their track record indicates they are more likely to have another accident. But while insurance provides a bulwark against unforeseen loss, it does not protect against routine expenses. Car insurance protects you in the event that you wind up in a car wreck or your vehicle is stolen. But it doesn't cover routine maintenance like oil changes, replacing brake pads, or tire erosion. Why? Because everyone needs routine oil changes, new brake pads, and new tires. So there is no risk to protect against. Health insurance in America works very differently. Many of us have health insurance plans that aren't insurance at all. They're really prepaid health care plans. They cover routine checkups, less serious illnesses, and recurring expenses like prescription medications, in addition to protecting you from a health disaster. All of this has made health care much more expensive and complex than any other form of insurance. That is true whether you get your insurance through your employer, through the government, or if you pay for your own plan. The Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, was passed on the promise that it would fix these issues and bring down health care costs. But it has actually made the problem much worse. First, it limited the variety of health insurance plans private companies could offer. 
It did this by mandating that every plan had to cover the same set of 10 health benefits, including preventive care, maternity care, mental health care, and contraception. Second, Obamacare prevented insurers from charging premiums based on the risk they were assuming. A person with a much higher risk of getting sick couldn't be charged more than a person with a much lower chance. These two aspects of Obamacare, requiring all policies to have certain coverages and not allowing insurance companies to charge more for riskier clients, caused the price of insurance to rise dramatically. In Arizona, for example, the price more than doubled between 2016 and 2017 alone. So, how do we undo this mess? By making health insurance more like, well, insurance. First, stop making people buy plans that include things they won't use and don't want. Second, allow health insurers to offer more options at different prices. Do these two things, and you'd make health insurance a lot more affordable for a lot more people. And what about people with pre-existing conditions for whom every insurance plan is just too expensive? We do what any compassionate society does. We make sure they get the medical care they need. But we don't need to upset the whole concept of insurance and make health care more expensive for everyone else to do it. Most Americans want to do the responsible thing and insure themselves against catastrophic health care emergencies. But with health insurance costs rising every year, being responsible is becoming more difficult. I'm Lon He Chen, Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution for Prager University. If you wonder uh, why your conservative, or should I say Republican, folks haven't rejected Obamacare, it's because they don't want to. Because they're being bought out by insurance companies who control them and fund them, fund their campaigns, and pharmaceutical companies, and they... Paul Ryan's and the Mitch McConnell's of the world don't want free enterprise. That's why they don't want Donald Trump. That's why the re- primarily the Republican party is against as against Trump as the Democrat party is. So, uh, let me move on here. And I want to just mention this, uh, the city council of Sacramento has voted. I want you to think about this. These are citizens who came from all walks of life that got on the city council, but now they are voting unanimously to pay gang members $1.5 million to not kill people. Now I want you to just think about all the things that you elect city council people for and the amazing arrogance that they have to go into this position and take your tax money and my tax money and do stupid stuff with this. The money is going to go, it's based on a program in Richmond, California, that supposedly lowered the amount of killings in the, in the city. The money will go to 50 men who are suspected of killing people. I want you to think about that. You suspect someone of killing people, so then you pay him off so he does not kill other people. Isn't that interesting? There's not enough evidence to prosecute these 50 men, so they give them money because they suspect that they they like to kill people. So Nicole Clavo uh, says, I guess she's on the city council, the 50 shooters have the possibility of taking a life. If we can reach those 50, how many lives have we changed? Now, this is an exact... This is a great example of putting your money where your mouth is. Why doesn't Nicole give her personal income to 50 shooters if she's so worried about them rather than spending your and my money? Now, this is the same problem I have with the 14 Forward project. Recently, uh, County Administrator Mitnick, Scott Mitnick, said that the homeless issue is not a problem. It's just a challenge. Challenges really don't have ever an end date or any solution. Problems have solutions and end date. A problem, you fix the problem. And so Mitnick is basically saying, you know, it's the same argument if that Lyndon Johnson would have made in the 1960s. It says, listen, I think we can, we can solve poverty. And the way to solve poverty 
is take money from one household and give it to the household next door to raise their income. In other words, they call that communal living or communism, where you take one batch of money from one group of people who are taking care of themselves and give it to people who aren't taking care of themselves. And so what you're doing, like in 14 forward, where they built these little huts and put people and totally now have, they've collected, uh, actually, you, Marysville has become a sanctuary city for the homeless. And they, they are swearing up and down that this is such an innovative program and just trust them. They're going to spend millions of dollars between tens of millions of dollars between Sutter and Yuba County that really what they're doing is they're going to save the world by this and they're going to eradicate homelessness. It's a bunch of malarkey. They've been doing it for, since the 1960s at the federal level. There's 127 different poverty programs and they haven't accomplished a thing except redistribute income. That's what this is all about. Now I was talking to the other day on Friday, Doug Eshman, who's the, been the uh, very successful principal, one of the most successful principals in the two counties. He's the principal of a el an elementary school called Mary Kovalot Elementary. Before Doug took over, he was out in Oliverst as an assistant out there, I think at Oliverst Elementary. And I met him during the flood, the last flood we had out there in 96, 97, wherever it was. And Doug, before he took over Mary Kovalod, it was uh, given up by the district as an armpit school because it had a high turnover. Downtown Marysville has a high turnover of pupils. People move in and out of Marysville in that part, has, has homeless kids going there. It was the kids were just, you know, it was the kids' fault. It was the parents' fault. Crappy scores, crappy school. Doug came in there. He told me yesterday or Friday, I guess it was yesterday, that that their school was the highest scoring school in the district this at this last whatever this last period of time whether it's last school year or not and i said well how's it going because we had done a lot of work down there at the school at church of glad tidings at one time they couldn't afford to paint the school they couldn't afford to do landscaping this is how bizarre this the school system run we painted the school i got a uh a, 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 an architect designer uh, interior designer to design colors for the school. We came up with kind of a McDonald's color scheme. We painted the entire school for free and I planted, uh, landscape trees around and, and they'd gotten up, they'd got about 10 years on them. And at, at the, if you look at the corner of seventh and uh, G street across from the chime mansion, you'll, you'll see these modulars there and you'll wonder what I'm talking about. You think I'm crazy, but we had huge London plain or what they call sycamore trees around that corner to shade all those modulars. So no, we no sooner got the trees up and shaded and everything. And we had the, the school painted a few years later the the, they came around where they had maintenance funding again. So they came in and painted that beautiful school that we had all in bright children's colors they painted, painted at Folsom Prison gray, cut off all those trees one weekend, and now we have no, we have direct sun on all these modules. Just crazy stuff. Well, anyway, Doug and I were talking yesterday, and he says, because I said that they had put up all this amazing fencing that made it look more and more like a prison. He said, actually, Lou, since they started 14 forward and attracting homeless people to town, he said, in all the years I've been at Mary Kovalod School, I've never experienced so much damage and theft and uh, goofiness on our school campus. He said, I'm still thankful for that fencing system because we got some real scary characters around our children every day. They got about 500 kids. About half the kids at Mary Kov Kovalod School are, inter are, are intra or inter-district transfers. They're either coming from other schools in Marysville or Yuba County, or they're coming in from Sutter County, about half the kids in that school system, in that school campus. But he said, actually, Lou, I'm so thankful that we've got all this extra security fencing because we've got some really gnarly folks in our city now. And what we've done is we've invited them, Robert Bendorf, by putting up the Bendorf Zoo, Aaron Easton, who's the city police chief who won't uh, enforce the law on 
uh, camping. There's people sleeping all over town, uh, doing all kinds of stupid stuff. People were screaming up and down 11th Street yesterday, uh, you know, telling everybody to F off and telling them they were nuts. You know, it's just crazy throughout the downtown area. I don't know. I can't speak for out in East Marysville. I live in downtown. Totally changed the composition of our neighborhood. Uh, it's it's become basically uh, all averse in Marysville now. So um, anyway, that's the nice thing. The good news about it is Mary Kovalev School is packed with kids. There's kind of a waiting list. Plus, it's got the highest scores in the area. I don't know how many years Doug's got left in him every year. I think it's going to be his last year. But my point is, when you turn over, when you turn over uh, – these uh, government situations uh, to politicians, you're going to end up with a predicament because when they get into positions of power, they begin thinking about uh, what they want to do with your and my money instead of thinking about how little money they can get by on and thinking about how to shrink government they think about how to en how to enlarge government and it becomes a problem i want you to think about every every area of life that you're involved in uh, and think where is government not involved i want you to think about that where is government not involved in your life i can't think of any i can't think of one area whether it's my bank account i i went into it's interesting i went in to send some money to vietnam at a check cashing place they do western union and the gal said to me uh she says you're sending you're sending too much money overseas i said why do you care what i'm doing she said well it's against the law and and why are you doing this this gal She's like a, 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 she's like a by the hour worker. And, uh, she says, you're, you're sent. I, I said, I said, I don't even know why you're asking. If you want to turn me into the government, just turn me into the government. I don't care what you do, but what do you, you either want, you either want my business or you just tell me what you want me to do. You either want my business. I'm paying you to send some money to Vietnam. Well, how I said, you know, it's none of your business what I'm doing. Uh, I'm sending money, uh, I'm, I have some projects I'm working on over there. I'm sending money. If you don't like me to do business to you, just tell me what you do. If you want to turn me into the government, do that. And she said, well, you know, the government's concerned about people sending money overseas. I said, How, why, why is there Western Union then if we can't send money? I mean, it's unbelievable. Whether I'm sending money overseas, I go buy gas, right? I can't drive my car without a smog. I got to pay a DMV fee. I got to pay sales taxes. Uh I can't, you know, in the city of Mary's, although I don't pay attention to them, they tell me I can't paint my house any color I want, right? I'm paying through the nose for water. Why? Because I got a monopoly screwing me because of the government control over that. It doesn't matter what I do. The government is involved in my business, right? You got to get a permit for this, a permit for that. Uh, you get permission for this permission for that we got too much government i call it being kumard my friend kairam kumar who was instructed by the government after he got a a liquor license he cannot sell a 16 ounce beer it's called getting screwed i'm i've changed the name to being kumard Government thinking that they have a right to say, well, yeah, you can sell that kind of candy bar, but you can't sell that kind of candy bar. You can sell this over here, but you can't sell that over there. You can sell a 24 ounce beer or 12 ounce beer, but not a 16 ounce beer. Listen, people, the beer is not the issue. The issue is government got their nose under your tent every time you look around and ripping you off and taking advantage of you. So listen, we need to lean against politicians who want bigger government. Now, one of the things that Trump did, which, which is actually shocking to me when I saw it, cause I just didn't see it as clear as when, when he ran 
so many people hated him from the right and the left. That got my attention in a big way. And I'm telling you, what you're seeing right now, if, if, when, if you voted for Trump, what you're seeing now is you're seeing the entire system, it's called the swamp, hate this guy and will eventually take him out, I believe because they hate him and that they want is political power. It has nothing to do with public service, helping you being a better, taking care of you, taking care of the United States, being more secure, having a healthier environment. It has, that's all just facade and charade. It has nothing to do with all that. What this is all about is about take compl- uh, controlling power, managing the wealth, and keeping the people that take care of Paul, the Paul Ryans and Mitch McConnell's of the world, making sure, sure that they're taken care of while the politicians are taken care of. you got to see it clearly. So, uh, okay, just back to the, I'll just finish this up. Tea Party, the 18th is the next meeting, the 18th of this month. And this Wednesday is the big Sabufka meeting, Sutter Butte Flood Control, City Council, Yuba City, Civic Center, and Butte House Road, 1 o'clock. So uh, we're calling it a day. I got these sports guys all f- lathered up and frothing at the mouth out here outside this door, wanting to come in here and talk about something that probably doesn't make any difference to anybody. <laughs>